When someone comes to me and say, look, I'm using the framework and I got this problem and I have never heard of that person before. That is a huge success for me because people can use it without me or my colleague uh, having to help. Every page in Confluence published with the framework has a label saying that it's from the framework. And once a month, I go to Confluence and get the pages with that label. And every month, the number of pages increase. I think it's a good measure of success. Welcome to the API Deluxe podcast. My name is Laura Vash, and I'm going to be your host today. Our guest today is Paula Cristina Vaz, and you're checking in from Portugal, right? Yeah, from Braga, Welcome. the best city in, in Portugal. <laughs> and you were born there? Uh, no, actually, I was born in Angola. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I came here when I was very little. I was three years old old when I came to Portugal and then I grew up here so I'm more Portuguese than than from Africa but yeah but it's cool. Welcome and thank you for coming. So for our audience we have met through the API Didox conference uh, although we have never met in person. Um, Paula is working at a very very interesting company as a senior technical writer I hope that you can tell, tell a little bit about the company itself because I, I just, yeah, well, you know, I find the business very interesting. Um, but um, the main topics for today is about scaling documentation uh, and the efficiency uh, and success of the business that this documentation um, is helping. So welcome very much. Uh, but before we go into the business of documentation, so I would very much like to hear about your career path, because it's always so interesting to know how someone arrived to the point where they are. So um, I started working as a function, functional analyst, uh, and then uh, I moved to uh, a company named uh, Altitude that uh, did uh, software for uh, call centers. I worked there for a while and then I went to do my PhD in computer science. I did book recommendation, which has a lot of um, natural language processing. And then I returned to technical writing because um, for me, technical writing is a little bit like research where you do and learn and try things and then you write about it. And then I went back to Altitude and then from Altitude I came to Farfetch. I met Farfetch since uh, 2017. I started in Lisbon and then I moved to Porto. So you uh, started uh, at the company as a technical writer. Were you the first technical writer or you started in a group that was already busy uh, with what you do? I started with a team of technical writing. We have a team dedicated to technical writing, which was responsible for the almost public developers portal. And I started documenting APIs and, um, and that's it. Over the years, did it change a lot what you do? Did your focus shift? Yeah, uh, the, when I came to Porto, I focused on, on documenting authentication and authorization. And uh, that was a, um, a more focused, um, a more focused work. Uh, in before I was, um, I was documenting the the global API, and the, we have to know all the business at at Farfetch, which is very complicated. Now it's is simpler. Um, the the down part, if you want, if you can say it like that, is that. Um, when documenting APIs, we have uh, we have specification in uh, in Open API, which is more uh, easy to process. And uh, here in the authentication, we have to to document the, the authentication API by hand. Where did you learn API documentation? How did you learn it? I learned it with my previous manager. He taught me uh, Open API. And, uh, and then talking with uh, the developers and uh, also developers would come to, to us on how to, to name the endpoints and things like that to, more, to be more user-friendly. Recently, Farfetch published a, a blog post, and uh, I think you wrote it, about how you have set up a documentation framework to automate documentation production so that you would be able to scale it. 
and go into a lot of details, but can can you narrate that from where did this come from? Who were the stakeholders who were behind it? And what role did you play? And how did you not lose your mind in the meanwhile? So when I came to Porto and I had to document that education and an authorization, I was faced with a, with a challenge which was documenting in confluence. I'm a little bit biased because I don't like conf confluence and... Um, I think for technical writing, confluence can be a little bit tricky because uh, if you if you have to I don't know delete ten pages or something like that, you have to go one by one and uh, or or use workarounds. If you have, for instance, to do replacements in several in several pages, you will have to open. If you have to do this in 50 pages, you will have to, have to open the 50 pages one by one, do the replacements, and then go to the next one. Uh, this, if you, this for uh, large documents and large sets of the of documents is very, very hard to do, and uh, it consumes you a uh, lot of time. So I start thinking. How could I work work around Confluence? Since Confluence was our internal place to put documentation and technical documentation, I start I start thinking about it. Then I I I thought about Markdown and start to some some documentation in, in Markdown that would uh, be in um, in a Git repository. And then talking with developers, uh, we came to the to the problem. We, we trust where to publish that documentation. Confluence is the place here at Firefetch where developers go to to get internal information. So I did a, a little bit more of research and I found the uh, Confluence API and I started developing uh, scripts to upload the, uh, the, the Markdown files to Confluence. The scripts have to do a little bit of conversion first because uh, Confluence has its own HTML and the, its own macros, um, and you had to to guarantee a, a, a structure for the documentation that you are doing. Uh, I developed the the scripts uh, as a prototype and start using them, and things were going well. And uh, I was discussing with developers uh, the the documentation in a Git repository, doing merge requests and uh, and all that process, which is very close to the the process of their code. So they were very aligned with me. And uh, and then there was uh, um, a colleague from other team that liked the idea and uh, they helped me develop a, a more uh, stable version of the, the prototype that uh, I was using. And so the documentation framework was born. This was the, the beginning. After that, I talked with some developers in the coffee in coffee breaks and things like that, and they liked the idea. So the, the documentation framework was, was starting was being used by by other teams that were asking to to do so. With time, they they also start proposing changes and adding new features. Like for instance, a thing that I I thought uh, would be very useful was uh, include emojis in in documentation. And there was one developer that uh, helped develop this feature, and uh, and other features came with their help. We thought we kind of uh, had inner source with the documentation framework. Were you doing inner sourcing before in, in different formats? No, just with the, I start with documentation framework. And in the post, if I'm not mistaken, you're also talking about um, this being the framework and, and the possibility for scaling. Now, actually, all that documentation has to be produced and that cannot possibly be written by one person. So how did you do that? These coffee break conversations also had the target to change developers' mindset because uh, some of the of the developers are not so keen on on documenting because it's it's tedious and uh, they like to code but they don't like to write. But I start also collecting a number of page uh, views from um, from Confluence. And uh, every time I talked with the developer or with the team, I, I said, oh, look at this page. It had 
I don't know, a thousand views. Imagine that uh, uh, a thousand times someone is poking you to, to ask for something. Don't you think documentation is important? And so this start to convince them that uh, maybe they should document and that the documentation is important and useful, not only for the reader, but also for the, the producer that um, that don't have to be, don't, that don't have to be, um, interrupted all the time to give uh, to give information and also to give the same information every time to put it into a bit of a context of what you were up against or for how many developers uh, are working on the api and how many endpoints does it have if there's only one api that we're talking about uh, externally uh, um, parfetch has a public api mm -hmm. with uh, with lots of endpoints i don't know it's more than 300, and um, but there is the technical writing team to take care of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, internally, we have a, a service architecture, so e each service has a, has an API, and I th I also think we have more than 100 services. I, I'm not sure. So these APIs that are used internally need documentation and need to be exposed exposed so that don't developers don't have to book each other for information. The last time I checked, I, I think we have uh, over 5,000 5, developers. So it's a lot of people needing, needing information. If each team has the possibility to document their own service and their own API in an automated and quick way, I think it's a win-win for all developers in the company. Mm -hmm. The documentation framework allows that because uh, it also allows the publication internally of the, the specs using the open API macro of, uh, of Confluence. You mentioned that with this, you also started inner sourcing practices. Uh, I'm very, very interested in that. If you could talk more about that, like what do you measure? It's an interesting point. What is the measure of success? What are the KPIs and, and how do you... How do you see that inner sourcing is being practiced? We don't have really measures, but, um, and I'm talking just about the documentation framework. I don't know if, uh, I, I know that other teams that have uh, also libraries and things like that uh, do it in collaboration with, uh, with the teams, not, not just them. Um, in our case, um, we talked with uh, with um, open source sky that we have and uh, it has the rules for the for the projects that we have in in open source and um, we defined that set of rules and opened the framework for collaboration like uh, github projects mostly mm -hmm. team sometimes slack me and tell me oh you, uh, I have been working the documentation framework and uh, I really need this feature. What do you think? Um, and I said, go for it. And then they changed the, the code. They, they did um, a mesh request in the, in the framework repository. And uh, me and my colleague uh, would review it and approve it or ask for changes if uh, it was the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a, a, a new a new version was released of the of the framework. If somebody takes uh, an asset from the central uh, repository, let's call it that way, and uses it, and then makes their own version, and then suddenly there's a hundred versions being uh, at use of the same thing, and adjust it to to the specific needs in the specific smaller context. Um, it's easy to get to the same point where you started, that there's multiple versions of the same thing running parallel, maybe needlessly. How do you, how do you keep it still converging to, to one where possible? I'm specifically asking about inner sourcing, um, the, 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 the problems with, with inner sourcing once people actually start doing that. Well, the, in this case, we also need to give some support because HTML uh, Confluence HTML and the, and the conversion from Markdown to to Confluence HTML has its its tricky parts and um, some of the errors and things like that we learn along. 
uh, has we use it and um, and sometimes someone that is using it uh, um, reach out to me and says look i have this i have this this error that i cannot uh, uh, fix uh, can you help me and then in that case I, I i ask if they are using the correct version of of the framework or not the uh, developers are free right and uh, you cannot control them and uh, even if you say over and over and over that they should use that version of the, of things they always want to do things uh, their way we don't have uh, that much of a problem and uh, i have noticed uh, developers using their own version typically they they use the, um, the version of the framework that is in in the repository mm -hmm. another thing that uh, that uh, we managed to do was to find a, a flow in the pipelines that always point the, to that uh, to that repository where the official version is so they they use the pipeline pointing to that uh, to that version and uh, when they want new features tend to to ask for changes in the in the main repository i did also a user guide for the documentation framework and sometimes someone talks to me saying that they are using the framework and i have never heard of them and we never have talked before it so it has its own life uh, doing this uh, this work, what was the most surprising success? What you were kind of crossing your fingers for that this is going to work, and then surprise of surprises, this, it just worked out without a hitch. There, there are two things. When is when someone uh, comes to me and say, "Look, I'm using the framework and I got this problem, and I have never heard of that people of that person before." That, that is a huge, uh, huge success for me because it's working, it's alive, and uh, people can use it without uh, me or my colleague uh, um, having to help. It's autonomous, which is, is huge. The other one is when I, uh, because I have another hidden trick, which is every every page published with uh, in Confluence published with uh, with the framework has a, a label saying that is from the framework. And um, I, once a month, because it uh, is a heavy process, I go to Confluence and get the pages with that label. And uh, every every month, the the number of pages increase. So I think it's a measure. Uh, it's a good measure of success. And the opposite? What are the blockers that are just, yeah, wicked blockers that are not going anywhere? I think that we we have to improve is error handling because sometimes we we don't have a a, a link for Markdown and uh, sometimes we are we write things in Markdown that are not compatible with the conversion to HTML Confluence. And uh, a real simple thing is this, for instance, you cannot format a string uh, as code and put it inside a link in Markdown. I don't know why, but this conversion th does work well. And uh, and um, when you try to upload it to Confluence, the error is not uh, specific. And sometimes uh, to find out where the error is, I have to break down Markdown files and uh, almost uh, keep doing uploads line by line just to, to find the problem. At, at the beginning, it was like that. Now I have some intuition because we we gain experience. And this, this is a, a, a real blocker to use the framework. But I'm also hoping that um, uh, if we manage to move uh, a large part of the documentation to Markdown files, uh, one of the days we could think about uh, other site or another static generating software or something like that to, to publish the, the, this documentation internally. What are the next immediate and maybe future uh, goals for you uh, in your role and maybe also professionally to learn? In my role now we are experimenting with, with the opposite um, flow, which is... Uh, allowing um, people that uh, like um, I don't know uh, product managers and uh, people that are not uh, so techy mm -hmm. to write in Confluence and export things to Markdown. It's a little bit tricky also because Confluence has a lot of 
of macros to handle and some of them don't have conversion to, to markdown but um, but i think if we can uh, define some rules we can do this this process and once again put out all the documentation or technical documentation either from developers or product managers uh, in markdown format and then we see where we where that takes us and uh, as has my professional career, I'm doing some studies uh, in this direction to to have something like uh, uh, ChatGPT to do the technical documentation, something like where you go and you ask, oh, how do I use the API to create products in Farfetch platform? And he gives you all the answers even, and even the code. Do you think that you approach this differently because you were um, studying natural language processing? Maybe the um, lot of things that I do, um, I have, I, I got from there. Mm -hmm. Now the, with the framework, I'm also investing a lot in the, um, automatic generated uh, documentation. Not only the the one that comes from that comes from uh, API specifications. But also things like um, from talking to with developers and product managers, I found out that, for instance, uh, some of them were keeping track of uh, of user roles in the spreadsheets, and then they were spreadsheets that were manually updated, and then they were never up to date, and then it was hard for them to go to. I don't know, to a Jira card or something to find out that new roles were created and things like, and things like that. I start um, investigating these, these type of, uh, of situations. And for instance, for the roles, I find out that uh, we have a, a hand uh, an endpoint that gives all the policies and roles. And um, it was easy with the Python script because I have this this philosophy that you can solve every problem with the chocolate or a Python script. So <laughs> I, using a Python script, um, I, I just converted the, the, the JSON from from the, this endpoint and generated the markdown, which is comfortable for mm -hmm. readers to read and uh, is always up to date because it's a script that can run every day and keep the information up to date. And uh, I'm also investing in this in this type of, um, of documentation. Is there a specific message that you would like to leave the audience with? A specific message is that automate everything you can because uh, because it saves time and it saves tedious work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And see you at the next conference. I hope. Yeah, I hope to. I hope so too. And I, I like to go to the one that is going to be in in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, yeah. I'm very much looking forward <laughs> to meeting you in person finally. <laughs> and I hope it's going to be uh, interesting and, and useful content too. Yeah, it will be. I'm sure of it. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovix Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.